Over the past three years, the Convex Seascape Survey has studied the hidden life of the ocean floor, collecting, identifying and analysing creatures living in the mud and their role in carbon storage. On their latest expedition to Jersey, the scientists are taking a molecular approach. By extracting environmental DNA, or eDNA, scientists can reveal the genetic fingerprints left behind by organisms, past and present, hidden within layers of sediment. This shift allows us to look deeper and further back in time, to see which species were once here, which remain, and which may have played an important role in locking away carbon. From this, they hope to better understand which animals and habitats we need to protect today to safeguard our climate for tomorrow. Considering its huge area, the seafloor and its sediments are largely understudied. What can look like empty mud could actually be a huge store of carbon. Keeping this locked away could be critical in tackling climate change. Dr Tom Rowland from the University of Exeter is one of the scientists working to understand where this carbon comes from. I think one thing that, that will surprise people in terms of carbon that's found in these ocean sediments is that it's not necessarily derived from the ocean itself. Um, and that's one of the things that our, our part of the project is really uh, focusing in on is exactly where it's come from. So we're hoping in understanding um, that, that dynamism, we're going to be able to answer a lot more questions about their role in the global carbon cycle. The use of eDNA is um, pioneering really in this sort of context in terms of examining the, the amount of carbon and particularly the source of carbon. So what eDNA really brings us is that granularity, that really specific um, analysis as to the source of that carbon. The first major challenge is to physically collect the sediment from the sea floor whilst keeping it intact. They do this using cores. We did multiple different kind of methodologies for coring in Jersey. We had uh, hand coring, so we actually did that using scuba. So we'd be diving down to about maximum 30 metres um, and hammering in drain pipes into the, into the sediment. Although it's quite labour intensive, it's quite a nice way of collecting cores because we really maintain good sediment water interface, so we're not mixing up that top layer of the core. But then we also have on top of that a large industrial scale vibra corer a six tonne piece of kit that can really drive down sort of five, six metres into the sediment to, to take much longer cores in, in harder substrates. So we did a kind of wide range of, of coring in Jersey. These cores are a gold mine of information for the team. And it's not just eDNA they'll be researching. As you travel down the core, you go back in time, sometimes thousands of years. But in order to anchor any data to a timeline, the team first have to establish the age through dating. The first thing is to anchor the core with age that we, I don't do in the lab, but we have some external facility where we send certain matters from that sediments down the core, down the depth. We use shale matters, bivalves to date them to anchor the depth with the age. We can't assume that the depth and the core um, correlates to the age for every single core. So uh, 10 centimetres in one core may be, say, 1980, but in another core, that's actually at 50 centimetres. So what we do is we employ lead to 10 dating and radiocarbon dating. So lead to 10 we use in the top uh, about 20 centimetres of that core, and the radiocarbon allows us to capture the older ages, um, so further down that core as well. Now to power up our biological time machine and start extracting the eDNA. Organisms have DNA and when organisms remain in the environment, the DNA can be in the environment through different natural processes like fecal matters or the decaying of their cells. When they die, like the DNA can come into the environment. It sits there for hundreds or maybe thousands of years we take it to our lab and we extract the DNA. So you will have so all of the bits of sand, all of the bits of rock, all of the bits of cell debris. So you have a, uh, a cell, you've got all of the cell walls, all of the other parts of that. All we care about is the DNA, so we have to get rid of all of that. So the extraction process is all around trying to get rid of everything but the DNA and leave us with the purest DNA. So what we can do is we transfer this um, into our lysis tubes, 
and DNA extraction are there to yeah, break essentially break all of our cells open, get all of that DNA into solution. We want to have make sure that DNA is as intact as possible. So the more intact it is, the better analysis we can do and the better that informs. That was the easy bit. Although the DNA molecules have been extracted, they're all mixed up together. To work out which bit of DNA belongs to their respective organisms, the scientists need to conduct genetic sequencing. It's like a grocery shopping. When you will enter a shop, you can see that every specific product has their different barcode. Likewise, the DNA has their own barcode. For particular barcode, you can say that this is from this particular organism or particular gene. There are some regions of DNA or genes where we know what exact code matches a specific organism. We have um, libraries of um, like whole genomic uh, information about these certain species and we can target uh, that when we do all of our lab analyses. So we prepare our mixed up DNA by isolating and amplifying just these regions. All of that goes in a sequencer, which reads the genetic code for every single piece of DNA. By comparing these codes with the online database, you can look at what matches, telling you which organisms each bit of DNA came from at each depth in the sediment core. We will get presence of lots of organisms, maybe say like seagrass, plants and different terrestrial animals DNA will be present there. We can use those information for policy making also. This particular source of carbon is coming from this particular area. They are the most contributing ecosystem or organisms and let's say we should preserve this ecosystem. So in Jersey, we have these vegetated coastal ecosystems, so the seagrass beds, and they are blue carbon ecosystems. So we know that they store a lot of carbon and lock them away from the atmosphere. And that's actually a lot more than what we see on land from the forests um, for the area that they cover. We want to know and where the carbon's uh, accumulated in the sediments and whether the influence of that is just in the immediate habitat or whether it's further away, it can help us to inform policy on uh, like protecting just the seagrasses or whether we should start looking at protecting the areas surrounding that as well. Yeah, so there's, there's no doubt that what we're proposing to undertake in the Convex Seascape Survey and, and you know, just our work package element is a, is a huge undertaking scientifically. Um, I think people have uh, potentially a, a, a perception of science that you can get your sample, you put it into a, a shiny silver box, you get a number, you publish your paper. The reality is that there's huge amounts of logistical work, particularly in, in the area that we're working in. So it's not a quick process, but I think good science shouldn't be a quick process. It's important to give um, projects like this that are really tackling very important global environmental problems, the time and the funding that they need. And that's exactly what we've, we've been lucky enough to get through the Convex Seascape Survey. <laughs>